Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's UCSF Virtual Alumni Program, UCSF Alumni Author Series, A Conversation with Susan Wong. My name is Myung Ko, and I am currently an assistant professor in the Division of Gastroenterology at UCSF. I am very excited for tonight's talk as I, I myself have a special interest in constipation and matters surrounding the intricate art of defecation. And there is no better person than Susan to enlighten us tonight. Susan and I first met about four years ago when I was a gastroenterology fellow at UCSF. Around that time I had become increasingly aware of the significant burden of constipation, uh, which was weighing on my patients. And everyone I spoke to about my interest unanimously told me, you have to go see Susan Wong. So I made my way over to Mission Bay where Susan at that time had a very thriving practice of long-term patients who were really struggling with issues of defecation. I remember meeting Susan and thinking, wow, I wish I could have even half the expertise on this topic and finesse and in interacting with these patients that Susan does. And I'm so glad that I met Susan then because she really inspired me to care for patients with constipation in a holistic and compassionate way and shared her decades of wisdom and knowledge with me that I will carry on in my career. Susan is a dear colleague, teacher, and friend to me, and I hope you will all be inspired by her talk today. Before we get started, I would like to review a few housekeeping items to help with your experience. Please submit your questions during the presentation using the Q&A box. And uh, if you can, please do keep your questions brief. And given the size of the audience and the number of questions, our speaker may not be able to answer everything. And we hope you enjoy the conversation. So as I mentioned, our author tonight, Susan Wong, is a nurse with over 40 years of experience, 20 of which were spent specializing in colorectal health at UCSF. As news of her ex expertise became known, she was dubbed the poop whisperer or the rear admiral in her clinics. She also realized that the stigma around just talking about pooping was holding people back from real answers and improved health. In April of 2022, she published her book, The Power of Pooping, a cheeky diet and lifestyle guide to end constipation and transform your health with Dr. John Richick. We wanted to hear more from Susan about writing her book, and of course, get some great tips from the expert on how we can help break the taboo and at the same time, keep ourselves healthy and informed. So let's get to it. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, uh, Mel, for that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, I'm, I'm a little nervous, but uh, <clears throat> I am very honored to speak to everyone <clears throat> about constipation. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, this is so um, important of a subject. And so many people, like you said, are living in silence, suffering without knowing what to do about it. They can't tell, they can't share these problems with their family members. Um, they hide, uh, get up early to go try to do all kinds of things to help themselves poop before even their husband wakes up or their children wake up. And they go around all day kind of suffering in silence. They might call in sick to work. They might have pain. They may cancel out on occasions of invites and say, no, I can't do it today. So it, they're very affected, their quality of life and their health is very affected by it because they're thinking that, oh, constipation, no one talks about it. So maybe there's not that much to be done. Or maybe they do the, some of their own research about, oh, maybe I could go and buy some laxatives. And then they go from the extreme, they use too much of it. They don't know how to manage their condition. And then this becomes another uh, problem on top of another problem. So having um, this uh, clinic at UCSF, which I was in, for 20 years and it's even started before myself um, by the colorectal um, director at the time who recognized that um, these things were not operable. Some of these problems were not operable. And sometimes we need to just talk to the patients and explain the physiology of it and maybe go through a non-surgical approach to help these people. 
So I am very honored to be part of this uh, legacy of having this uh, Center of Pelvic Physiology and the excellent team of doctors that I got to work with over the years and learn from. And so um, that's been my, um, my, my mission, I guess. People say, how can you last so long? 20 years in one job. I'm saying, wow, you know what? This, this topic, this department, has so many multiple facets of um, physiology and psychological um, influences. And so I got to wear many hats in this position. And that um, gave me insight how much of a bowel makeover these people had to do. So, you know, I have to thank, um, the uh, fact that I was had this great opportunity to be part of the UCSF community, being accepted to the School of Nursing and um, learning that from the beginning of my first year in nursing school, um, that modern science, which was depicted in a show that I picked up uh, while I was uh, getting some rest from all that hectic time. And on the weekend, I might click on a show with a, some friends called Star Trek. And the mission statement of Star Trek of going where no man has gone before. Well, I think that's where no woman has gone before myself into gut health with uh, the colorectal team. And so being in that um, mindset, knowing that I'm in an environment that's really progressive with their thinking and open and teaching. That just made me grow. And so from all that support, I became who I was. And so that is kind of like where I am now. But um, I am sharing all that wisdom and seeing all that speed light of medical advancement from, from our scientists that I can use the technology and still put the human content into providing patients who have these ailments to help them empower themselves to become uh, aware of what their problem is, not be ashamed of being um, living in secrecy with these problems because they're not the only one. So through shredding all that uh, shame and, and fear through education and caring and uh, teaching, this is where this clinic became a very powerful clinic. And this also gave me so much autonomy to kind of create the, the format to help these people uh, overcome some of their uh, issues. So, a lot of these people come to our clinic really worn down from their condition, not knowing where to go to and finding us. And we're able to diagnose, assure them, treat them and giving, we do our work and we encourage them to do their work. And so um, this was very rewarding for the latter 20 years of my career at UCSF. So, um, then after having all that awareness, I used to get comments from the patients saying, oh, can you go to my mother's nursing home and talk about gut health? And I'd go, well, you know, um, I don't really go out that far and I'm not, you know, I'm really trying to take care of all the patients at the hospital. And uh, someone might say, well, can you go on the radio and talk? And, uh, you know, I never got around to that. And but our directors would go around to the hospitals and try to educate the community of some of the things that we do have to offer. And then that gets a little hard to do because you can only drive to so many hospitals. But what we did use, what, what I did use once I um, came out of my um, position at UC, I started to recognize that Yes, more people need to know about this. And I, my son inspired me and said, mom, you have so much to say. Why not start a YouTube channel 
um, about this with you. And so we just started writing content, filming ourselves, and now we're able to come into more directly into the patient's lives and teach them, hey, there is a lot about gut health. And I'm showing a lot of tidbits out of, uh, on TikTok and included on the Instagram. So I have a lot of information out there and the, uh, the fans write to me and say, hey, can you talk about this? Can you talk about that? And there's a lot of interest in everyone in the world from all over writing to me and they're all interested in improving their gut health. So this is where um, all this information should go into some kind of collective source. And so that was the birth of the book, The Power of Pooping. So that's where I am with uh, my career at this time. Oh, ask. May Young, are you there? Hi, I'm here, <laughs> Susan. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for this wonderful opportunity for us to ask some questions. Um, we already received a lot of great questions kind of prior to this event and also during. So allow me a moment to pull this up here. And please, as I mentioned before, submit your questions on the Q&A box. All right, okay. Um, so this is something, you know, um, that I notice a lot in my clinic. You know, I feel like year after year, I'm getting more and more referrals in the clinic and gastroenterology clinic uh, about constipation and, um, and oftentimes when I see patients in clinic, they're, they're saying, gosh, doctor, I've been suffering this with this problem for many decades prior to even coming to see you. Um, do you think that, you know, Americans are more prone to constipation than other folks around the world? And why is that the case, if that's, if that's truly the issue? Good question. I think that um, there's a lot of um, acceptance where we as Americans are very accepting of modern things. And one of the modern concepts is um, microwavable foods and um, instant food uh, preparation. And so we're not so much into making our food. And I think we lose a lot of information on what it takes to make a dish. And so we're not really getting the most nutritious meals and we're not always getting the full balance of a meal. So you could buy a box of macaroni and cheese on a tray and call it an entree. And you basically just eat that and you accept that as a meal. And yet you might come down with constipation afterwards. And in the old days, they had the TV dinner. So they had the, you know, the dessert, the uh, vegetable, the protein and the starch that was a better idea to cue into the eater that, oh, you should eat all these food groups, maybe not dessert, and that would give you a complete meal. And that was a TV dinner. But nowadays, we'll just buy a little box, no big than, bigger than this, and that would be your main meal, and that would be all you would eat. And you may drink some water or a beverage of your choice, and that's one thing. And then for breakfast, they might have a fiber bar and they think, oh, I'm on the run. I got to get to work and uh, I'll just pack a fiber bar and a protein bar and maybe pack a drink. I might grab a coffee and they call that a meal. So these things with constantly not being aware of what it takes to have a balanced meal, which I talk about in the book to help you uh, know that you have to have you know, at least 50% uh, uh, fiber and maybe 25% uh, protein and 25% starch. So that can help balance your bowels and uh, hydration with uh, drinking enough fluid, which I talk about it in the book too. 
So it sounds like really the modern diet is affecting our gut health pretty significantly. And this is pretty relevant during the pandemic. Um, a lot of people have um, taken up a social, you know, casual glass of wine here or two. So can you talk a little bit about the uh, alcohol consumption and how that affects our gut and um, bowel patterns? Right. More people were found to be drinking during the, during the COVID onset. And um, alcohol has a lot of sugar and it also alcohol itself uh, interferes with the metabolism and breakdown of our food and even the gut flora. And uh, too much drinking um, can also lead to potential liver uh, issues. So drinking is not the best way to um, pacify yourself as a, a, a way of feeling good. And also there's malnutrition associated with uh, excessive drinking. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as we get more and more data on the gut microbiome, there's a lot of great basic science research that's going on. And a microbiome seems to be a, the very hot topic um, in relation to your bowel symptoms, also in relation to your mental health and depression and anxiety symptoms, which obviously are very closely related. Um, yeah, is there, and, and hopefully we'll get to know a little bit more about uh, how our gut biome is uh, precisely affected by alcohol, especially in the post-COVID era. Um, in, in that vein, do you recommend using probiotics or specific fiber supplements into kind of your daily routine to help your digestion? Great question. There, um, there is data, even back to that last question of alcohol, that there's some research out there that says in order to metabolize some of that high sugar content, that you should use a probiotic to help you digest some of that sugar and, and uh, lessen some of the negative effects from the um, alcohol and sugar. So yes, yeah, so depending on your diet, um, I always promote on my TikTok not to just substitute supplements in place of food. And that's one key thing I want you to, to know because that is another problem I see in the clinic patients will bring a bag full of supplements and they think they're doing a great job in keeping themselves healthy. And then when you look at their diet diary and their poop diary, you realize, well, they take a medication list as big as a, a sheet of paper and they're eating so little and they're wondering why their stools are hard and, and they're having irregular bowel pattern. And so I always encourage them, you know, if you wanna take supplements, everything in moderation, and also check with your physician to see if you need to have all these vitamins, because some of these vitamins are water soluble or fat soluble, and you may not be having enough of those items in your diet to help you even process all these supplements. And, you might be just peeing all those supplements out of your urine. So over supplementation can be a big issue if you don't use it correctly. And, and you could find like, I found patients who just took too much magnesium and um, their diarrhea slowed down um, after I asked them to take less of it. And I'll give them like a little daily uh, RDA. I said, look at your RDA, your required daily allowance doesn't mean you have to take, you know, 2000 uh, milligrams of magnesium. You need to slow that down. And if you slow that down, you might see these things improve. So taking them in charge and giving them a diary to keep track of themselves is a, an important step in everybody's um, help in getting what is the main problem from um, all these people's um, excessive use of uh, supplements. Mm -hmm. You know, in my practice, I generally tell my patients, because I get that question a lot about kind of probiotics and supplementation, et cetera. And my personal preference is to always kind of favor natural sources of probiotics, like kombucha, kimchi, sauerkraut, things like that. Um, what is your recommendation to, you know, your patients and, and everyone who's kind of interested in this topic? 
Well, I, I do endorse that, what you're saying. Um, balanced meal, knowing that the food sources, if you kind of tell them or lead them, give them reading material, what the prebiotics can help with the probiotics. So the prebiotics are the foods that can help you build that good bacteria. And if you need more supplementation with the probiotics, you may add to it. And maybe you don't have to take as much of the probiotic because you already have the prebiotic helping you promote the probiotics. So, and you know, there's so much bacteria in our gut. We cannot take everything in a little pill. That we have trillions of bacteria in our gut. We 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 have. We're just at the beginning of this uh, journey of knowing what prebiotics are the best. But some prebiotics and uh, probiotics are helpful for certain kind of um, GI conditions. Uh, like uh, IBD, and so that helps you. But some people go overboard in taking too much probiotics. They go, okay, I got the refrigerated tide. I'm taking like a hundred uh, billion cells, and uh, you go, maybe that's too much because now you're complaining me, complaining to me that you're gassy, you're bloated, and you don't feel good. And and maybe if you start slow and work your way up, you might find that you know where your cutoff point is. Mm -hmm. Great. So then I'm going to take a moment and turn our attention to some live questions that have just come in. Um, so the first question is, assuming no allergies, can you share some essential foods we should eat on a regular basis? Uh, well, I think that we should have all the fruits and vegetables of the color of the rainbow. Um, fresh fruits are, are great. Um, it's not always that we could get to the store to do this, but even frozen fruits still have their vitamin, uh, essen their essential vitamin content. And um, I always like bananas. I always like uh, having oatmeal in the house. I eat oatmeal for many years. Uh, flax seed, chia seeds. Mm -hmm. uh, those things are great. You could do all kinds of great things to um, make tasty dishes. And, it all, and they don't always require a lot of cooking. I think a lot of people get kind of turned off when, man, I gotta go to the produce market again. And produce is getting expensive and they don't last as long. So even having some canned goods or dry beans then you could make your dishes at a later time and you can have those um, items to make um, later in your uh, you know, weekly menu. And uh, you could have potatoes and onions and garlic and ginger. Those are great. And the other thing that um, carrots are long shelf life. And I talk about that in my book that you don't have, don't have to have time to always run to the store and buy everything fresh. That's really hard. Yeah, I think it's quite daunting for many of my patients when we just give them a, a list of very high fiber foods and, and fruits and vegetables for them to incorporate in. So kind of your, it sounds like the basic takeaway points are canned foods, frozen vegetables and fruits are also uh, very good options that can kind of save you time and and help you include that. Do you have any other tips in terms of for a busy lifestyle, you know, career oriented folks who don't necessarily may not have the time to spend a lot of time cooking anything that that you have up your sleeve in terms of a quick smoothie here and there? That's my trick. So as much as I worked long hours at the hospital, I made a smoothie every morning. And my smoothie would have strawberries, banana, and blueberries in it. And I would add some protein powder that was fortified and then um, my um, milk base. Um, I'm lactose free, I, I, I mean lactose intolerance. So I like lactose free. And I would make like 20 ounces, keep it in a cool uh, container and bring it to my work to have as a quick uh, pick me up as I'm running around all day. So in the morning, I definitely do endorse having uh, a routine like that and uh, making soups and pressure cookers and Instapots 
and roasting vegetables maybe for a couple days because you have a big old tray full of uh, 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 whatever protein you want and uh, roasted vegetables and keep it together in Tupperware so you could bring it to work or wherever you're going or even at home when you're so busy. And there's a lot of people who order, mm -hmm. have meal plan systems that they order from out that have a nutritious meal uh, pl uh, mapped out for you. And you could enroll in those programs where they have everything pre-served for you and all you do is throw it together. And then there's also things that they have uh, prepared meals that you just open and eat your, eat, you know, eat fresh. So it all depends on your budget, your time, your skills in the kitchen. But you could still be very, um, not the greatest cook. You could still learn a few tips and then follow, use those methods to maintain a healthy uh, diet in your uh, everyday life. While we're waiting for Myung to get back on, Susan, why don't you let us know if you're working on another book or what you're working on right now? Okay, so I'm doing a lot of TikToks and uh, I have the book in my hand, um, The Power of Pooping, that you can find online on Amazon, uh, Ulysses Press, uh, Simon Schuster, Target, uh, Walmart and other uh, major bookstore, online bookstores. So am I working on another book? I'm spending a lot of time writing my TikToks because TikTok is a different format where you could only have like 15, 30 seconds to give some concise information out. So I spend a lot of time uh, every day. I have a, uh, an intern with me right now and we're, we're uh, cranking them out. <laughs> but That's thank you fabulous. Brett. yeah it's a lot of fun well I know you have over 630,000 followers on TikTok and we're putting some links in the chat near the end of this event so everybody can go take a look um, I do have a couple more questions while we're waiting for Myung to come back on um, how did you start to break the stigma around talking about gut health and poop since it seems to be a difficult thing to bring into a conversation. And so for we lay people, how do you start to break the stigma around that? Um, I think uh, it does take, I think it takes a lot of guts to talk about your poop health. Um, I think if things like the social media can make it more aware, bring the awareness to the public to, um, they, hey, say, hey, have you followed butt talks? Or have you watched this? Or have you read this book? And, you know, all she talks about is farts and poops and, um, you know, <laughs> diarrhea. Then that they might say, oh yeah, I love that uh, 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 social media channel. And then, uh, they, then they might say, oh, okay, great. Um, and then there are other parts of it like, I find that some of the viewers write to me and says, I have forwarded your uh, TikTok to my father because he spends too much time on the toilet. And so there's the awareness of a messenger of someone who does follow the TikTok uh, channel who will send it to another family member and say, dad, you need to really get yourself taken care of. She said, go see a doctor or try some stuff at home and maybe you could uh, handle that. And so um, talking about poop, it's not one of your everyday conversations Say, hi, how are you doing? In Chinese we say, hi, have you had lunch? Uh, have you had your meal yet? Like, have you ate dinner yet? Have, and, uh, and you might say, uh, yes, I have eaten, but some people greet that way. But also you could say, uh, have you pooped today? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but people don't really say that. But um, I don't know how to break that stigma, except constant um, delivery of materials that bring awareness to poop health. And I'm actually working on uh, a, a campaign 
on um, for um, co promoting colonoscopy awareness. So um, that I just uh, filmed today. And so that is very important because um, I did a, I, I stitched a, a, another physician out of the UK about looking at your poo. And that is um, something very important that people don't do. And even just taking a glance, you could tell a lot by your poop. And uh, then uh, my son had uh, started an app uh, from our channel to kind of take a picture of your poop. So then that links to what you should do with your poop. Oh, these are balls and maybe you should look at your uh, fiber intake, your fluid intake. And if that doesn't work, maybe you should uh, try something else or go talk to your doctor about it. So there's those things and there's other apps like that. And um, um, I think that the more we talk about it, it'll catch on be very popular. So if you have ideas, you can share them with me afterwards on how to promote poop, poop, poop health. I think you're doing a lot to break the stigma um, already. So um, we do have a couple more questions that have come in from the audience and it kind of links into you talking about people sharing this information with their parents. Um, how can we advocate for a healthier menu in senior homes and establishments since it's so, it seems it's so important to enhance their gut health for their overall vitality. And you said you went to visit some senior homes in your, in your past. What do you it's, think about that? It's it's a challenge. I uh, I not all uh, so like my mom uh, lives alone, and I bring her food for her because she since COVID she's been very hard. Very, it's been very hard for her to go out, and so um, I bring her food and I try to tell her what what are this uh, you know what she should eat and give her the healthy foods. And then I tried to sign her up for Meals for Wheels and she didn't like the taste of it. And so she called the Meals on Wheels people and says, I don't want your food. It don't taste good. But then I, I find out that there are other Meals on Wheels services like Meals on Wheels that might have food that's a little bit more tailored to her taste than Meals on Wheels. So there's another place in Oakland um, there's one for Japanese and for Chinese um, population who likes their Asian food, but then you get other ethnicities. What if they're they're Muslim and they don't eat pork? And uh, what if they're vegan? And there, this is a challenge to to cover everybody's uh, food preferences. So nursing homes are are kind of sketchy. They're expensive and they are, um, their food menus aren't always, they're made in a, in a massive amount and it's not very appealing to a lot of the um, members who live there. And some of them, you know, charge uh, a price for buying a meal and, and that's really unfair. There's a lot of injustice. And I think that uh, more work needs to be done in this um, department of improving um, nutrition for um, elderly in the nursing home setting. Um, you know, oatmeal is always an easy one uh, if they like oatmeal and their setting might be, they might have a hot pot, but it's really very individualized and it's hard to uniform make it standard, but um, I believe they have nutritionists on, on staff or advisors that can help them improve on their uh, meals for the elderly. Great, thank you, Susan, and sorry, everyone, for my um, connection problems. Um, the question that I was posing to you, Susan, when I got cut off um, is actually something that um, I think a lot of patients struggle with, and that's really around stigma around poop health. Um, can you give us a little bit of tips in terms of how to break the stigma that people have? And in fact, you know, oftentimes 
I have so many patients who say, I, you're the first person I've told you about this in many, many, many years uh, regarding my health. And how did you start to normalize this for your patients? Um, I think uh, first we, you know, they come in with a medical problem, like they are leaking poop. And uh, we do give them a questionnaire that's quite lengthy and we designed it as a team. And we go into, tell us what your problem is. And then we tell them to uh, rate what kind of poop they have. So we give them the Bristol stool chart so they could check it off. And we ask them how frequent they have this problem. And then we go into uh, a section of constipation. Do you push to poop? Do you miss days? Do you have uh, um, uh, problems with uh, uh, taking too many laxatives? Are you using laxatives? So we ask all about their meds and um, um, their background, their surgical history and um, uh, obstetric history. And then we go into a section on fecal incontinence. So we ask them about, are you losing poop? And uh, then we go into how does that affect your life? So we ask them that. And then that's sometimes where you find things that are very shocking to find out. Um, they'll say, I've been living like this for years and I don't wanna tell anyone, but now that I've been stuck with constipation for so long and my rectum is coming out. And I just didn't wanna share that. And then we also have a section on, have you been sexually abused? Because there's another avenue of sexual abuse uh, people who are guarded with their pelvic area. And that's a very difficult part to live with. And um, we advise them to have some psychiatric help. We might call a social worker in if there's some really ongoing problems in the house that is um, pointing to abuse at home. So it's a major problem. And so these parts when you say, okay, so now we're gonna test you. And once we test you, we're gonna figure out what's wrong with the muscle. So we get a sensory testing and we get uh, a muscle testing. We might uh, use an ultrasound to look at the structure of the muscle. Uh, we might get the nerve, um, a nerve test. And uh, we do all that workup and then they'll say, okay, now what? And then so we, have, we, pass, we meet together with the surgeon and we give, uh, give them all the data that we find. And then they might start crying and saying, I can't handle all this information. And you say, it's okay. You know, it's one thing at a time. You cannot handle everything. It's going to take, it's layers. You have to do one thing at a time. Stay focused on what we have to do for you today. We're going to bring you back and talk about some of the other options. We may have to do some other scanning and it's okay. And there's a lot of support that the provider has to give to the patients to say, write to me on Apex, you know, tell me what your questions are and we will come back and answer them at another time. But right now we need to give you the help you need. Mm -hmm. So I think after they get the diagnosis, and they get the game plan of what we have to do. And we say, we're gonna do our part, but you have to do your part. Then they feel like, oh, I got someone helping me. And that's where you kind of break that, that shame, that stigma. And then they start seeing themselves improving from the surgery or from the recommendations and then um, the support that we give to them. And then they um, are happier and they feel better about themselves. So it sounds like when patients feel like you're taking an interest in them, not just in a medical way, but psychosocial, emotional aspects around their life, that they're, they really find themselves able to open up to you about some of the most embarrassing details that they haven't been able to tell other people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this, as you know, Mayong, it takes time. 
and um, patience mm -hmm. to be empathetic to listening to their concerns. Yeah, that's 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 very very important. Mm -hmm. um, so you also touched um, upon just now that oftentimes the patients feel very overwhelmed by the amount of testing and the data and the information that's laid out in front of them. And one of the questions that just came in is, can you talk a little bit about the different testing that you might offer to someone? And, and in particular, um, uh, you know, they, how, are, how do you use demographies, manometries, and SITSMART? testing okay. and how a, you know how does that kind of play into your algorithm of working up a patient right so they have usually been worked up by gi your department and or another gi gastroenterologist mm -hmm. somewhere else and they should have had that work up to make sure they don't have any predisposition issues and so if it, everything that the GI department has figured out that we've done all uh, the testing, we did a colonoscopy, that's all clear, and they're still having problems retaining their poop or defecating, then we see them for that functional part. And so we use a, a manometry, uh, a catheter that we place inside the anus, and we measure the tension of the anus. We could also pick that up with a digital exam. The exam can tell us pretty quickly if we're skilled at understanding whether they even have the motions correct, uh, doing pushing and uh, relaxing and contracting. So our fingers are very educated. Okay, so we have that part where we could now advance into the manometry and we have this sophisticated method where we measure the pressure of these muscles and of course, there's a you know, baseline of what their tension should be. And we watch their behavior, the squeeze, the push, and the relaxation. And so then we also have a balloon attached to this catheter that will tell us the sensory or how much the capacity of the rectum is holding. So that information uh, is uh, very important for us. And then we bring them into the bathroom and we ask them to uh, push the balloon out. And there we can see whether we see hemorrhoids afterwards or prolapsed rectum, or even if a case of a female, we might see a prolapsing bladder or a large rectocele coming out through the vagina. And so then we use, if the patient has incontinence issues, we use an ultrasound that measures, it looks at the muscles 360 degree, and we're looking at the structure of the three layers of the muscle. The first part being the external sphincter, which is the voluntary muscle of our uh, anal complex. We have the middle muscle, the internal sphincter. And that's the part where when you have poop there and it's ready to come out, it actually gets the response from the rectum and it dilates and then your your part, the external sphincter, either you let go or you just, you might tense up. And so we also have a EK, uh, EMG, little electrodes on the outside to see if you're doing the motions correctly because you may be feeling the urge, but then you're tensing up when you're getting the, when the balloon is trying to come out. So it's like, whoa, this is not the way it's supposed to go. You're operating the opposite of what you should be doing. So this is something a person may have learned how to poop. They thought this is how they're supposed to poop, but it isn't. And so that's why they're having these problems. And so um, we could tell a lot by that. And then if there's uh, tissue calling, coming out, that's really more of a surgical case. And so then we pass them on to the surgeon and the surgeon will say, okay, now I've fixed your hemorrhoids or now I've fixed your prolapse, but you still have to know how to operate this month's muscle. So you have to go through rehab, which we call biofeedback. And that's another set of, another skill set and equipment that helps you watch your muscle. Now you're like learning with this uh, instrument inside of you by watching a monitor and seeing how you could properly do the operations of what your muscle is supposed to do. And you have your, 
therapist or your nurse practitioner or nurse behind you identifying all these uh, emotions. And so then uh, you're given some homework to work on and your homework is to kind of improve on your diet, improve on your defecation posture, and maybe if your muscles weak, improve on your strengthening. And we even have home uh, device where you could go home and give yourself treatment to watch how you relax your muscles or contract your muscles. So there's a big program at our department that helps you get to the bottom of everything, literally speaking. Right. And Susan, what's the most unusual case you've encountered in your career? Ah, the unusual case. Well, you know, the, some of the unusual cases like lifestyle. Um, there is some issues with um, in the homosexual community. They have interest in their anal intercourse. And yet the anal intercourse is causing them to have prolapse. And yet they still want to have the anal intercourse. And yet there's limitations on how much we can do to help them, but this is their lifestyle preference. And you could repair them, but then it comes back again, the prolapse. And so this is very challenging. And so there's that part. Um, other part that was very challenging and very sad, which we all never know what the end of uh, the story is, but we had a family who had the FAP and-, uh, and this, Can you elaborate? Can you tell the audience what FAP stands for? Well, it's, uh, I don't, it can't say the full name of it. It's a familiar- uh -huh. uh, at, at, I don't know what this polyposis uh, syndrome is. Yeah. So the mother, it's a genetic problem where the grandmother, had this um, genetic issue and uh, she had ulcers in her colon. So she had to have a colectomy done and she had what we call a J pouch. And um, then it turned out that her son was a carrier of it. And he too had ulcers and bleeding and bloody stools and he too had his colon removed. And so now the son who's in the forties has three children and these three boys now are carriers. They could be carriers and they're being screened at very early age by the pediatric GI with colonoscopies. And one of them in particular, the older one who was about 10 or 11 years old came to see me because so far the mother had care at UCSF the father had care at UCSF and the mother recognized the, the mother of the, the son, the husband, recognized that her sons have to get the colonosc uh, colonoscopies at an early age, but recognized one of them was always pooping in his pants. And so we had to work with um, the family. And so I got to see the son and the father was there with me and I had to like try to perform the manometry on him. And he did not want to be touched. I don't blame him. And um, I could do my exam. I started and I realized that he had, he was all full of poop back there. He hadn't done anything. And so I couldn't really advance and do anything since he was full of poop, but his father had to excuse himself and go poop in the bathroom right next to the exam room. And he, he could hear his father farting away. And he goes, that's so disgusting. And, and I said, well, how so? He goes, he's like that all the time. I just can't stand the noise. And then I realized that he did not want to use the bathroom because he was afraid that he might be letting out sound. And he just basically did not want to go to the bathroom. He did that for himself. He decided one day 
that he wasn't going to use the bathroom to be like his father. So what he was, his problem was he had frequent incontinence. And his mother was doing his laundry and realized every pair of his underwear is just full of poop. And we had to like say to him, son, you have to really get used to that everybody poops. You need to go to the toilet. And if you can't go to the toilet to poop, you at least have to go and clean yourself because this is not healthy. You're gonna be starting, you're already in junior high and you're gonna be starting high school. Cute guy, turning into a beautiful young man. And we had to get the pediatric social worker in there and we had to talk to the mother and they came from afar. The father was a prison guard out of Folsom, I believe. So they're not really equipped with a lot of funds. They're coming up here to get their, their work. The mothers, the parents are going broke over just medical care. And we had to get the, the pediatric social worker and they're not making their bills. And But the mother knows that he needs help. So we had to like join forces get him down to a program, have a little fanny pack in his uh, carried around with all the toilet stuff, have him have a note to the school, tell him, let him go to the toilet. When he feels that urge, he's basically just gonna go there and clean himself. If he can't poop, he don't wanna poop, the school toilets are supposed to be really gross, no doors. And so we basically said, you just need to clean yourself so you don't get caught smelling like poop around your classmates. And so we were able to do that. And then we were also able to trick him. I said, mom, his diet sucks. You need to give him fiber. So I said, if he can take a bottle of fluid and put some Benafiber in there and camouflage it with whatever colored drink you he likes, put it in there, and maybe he might get a stronger urge to poop normally, because we don't know what his problem was. But I think because of his father having the J pouch and his grandmother having those issues, he has decided that he didn't want to go to the toilet. And then we also asked him to wash his own own clothes. You need to take these clothes in the washer and dryer and wash your own clothes, soak your underpants because we're not going to buy you new ones. We had to lay the law down. Mm -hmm. It's like parenting more than anything. Then the, after multiple visits, we did have to drop off because insurance, um, the, just biofeedback only has so many visits that they're allowed. They're allowed six visits. So that makes the care in, in, inconsistent because he won't get this kind of care and he won't get to come see us. And there's nobody down in Folsom that does rectal biofeedback for adolescents. So it's like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do now? We just have to cross our fingers and say, like, we feel that we've given you enough of the tools and you could try to come back with when you have a different plan. But it is it is frustrating. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that experience with us, Susan. So we are uh, four minutes till the end of the hour. So I will end with one last question. And that is, how does it feel to be a TikTok star? <laughs> you know, I, I try to go in hiding because I try to not want to be recognized. I'm very, very shy. I don't like uh, all the attention. Have you been recognized uh, around town? Yeah, and I, <laughs> I don't like it, you know? And, you know, I just like, I like the mask. I like wearing my mask all the time. Uh, uh, yeah, someone more than once said, I've seen you before. No, you haven't. Yes, I have. No, I haven't. I don't know you. Yes, I know you. And I go, okay, whatever. And then they keep asking me. And then all of a sudden I said, I'm making an ex I'm making a return at Macy's, you know? I'm returning this because I don't like it. And I you know, <laughs> myself like this thing doesn't, what? You mean my return date is expired? Oh my God. <laughs> Isn't there any exception? No, no, mm -hmm. ma'am. And I'm going, and then he goes, 
um, maybe we'll talk to the manager, but I know you. And then I said, okay, you know me, maybe. And then I blurred out YouTube, TikTok. Yeah, you're butt talks, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and so I started laughing and I go, yeah. And then I said, well, thank you for uh, watching our show. So, and then, so that part goes and yeah, so it's fun. And I, I, like I said, I'm not, um, I just feel good that I'm sharing, um, you know, pub, I'm doing public health nursing again. You know, that's all I'm doing. <laughs> so oh, <wonderful>. nursing. <laughs> well, thank you, Susan, so much for the work that you're doing and for taking the time to chat with us tonight about your book and your background. And thank you to our alumni for your outstanding questions. Uh, please make sure to check out Susan's book on Amazon as well as her butttalkstv.com website. And we'll end the evening here. Um, everyone have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye.